Willing, any and everybody that would like to will be going to Yancey House, 6 o'clock. We'd love to have you go with us. Wednesday evening is our time of Bible study and prayer at 7, and we'd like for you to be there for that. Any other announcements that somebody has that I need to make? Yes, sir. I see you, brother. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Okay, anybody else have an announcement? Janie? And that's fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other announcements? All right. Sounds good. Any more announcements? Okay. Mayfrey? Here, I don't want you to be like Jeff. I want you to use mine. It's a last minute thing. Well, I guess you can tell this was kind of a last minute thing that came up, but I am so honored to be able to light the candle of joy uh, because that's 
that's what I live for is to find joy. And um, when Angie called me, I said, yes, I would, I would love to do that because I had already written some things down that pertain to that. As So here, here are some biblical facts about joy. Heavenly joy found in Luke verse 10 and 11. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus' birth brought great joy. Psalm 51 verse 12 tells about restored joy. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. The joy of thy, thy salvation. There's joy. Worldly joy. Uh, in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 7 through 9. Go thy way, eat the bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepts thy works. Let thy garments always be white, and let thy head lack no ointment. If I understand all this correctly, it means for to look for joy in this life. Try to find joy in all things. Uh, I'm going to get a little personal now. I have such joy in remembering past times of seeing my husband with a fr fresh hot biscuit full of butter and with him biting into it, with butter oozing, and him saying, mm, mm, better than cake, utter joy. Seeing love on my children's faces, joy. Watching my roses and my irises bloom, joy. Watching the hummingbirds uh, feed and do their aerobatics, joy. Watching my goldfish come swimming over to the edge of my little pond to eat from my fingers, joy. Looking around on Sunday mornings and seeing the fa faces of pa fa Pastor David <laughs> and the praise and worship team and the faces of my church family, adopted children and friends, joy, joy, joy. Joy is God's gift to lighten our hearts, and it's here for every one of us. Open your heart wide and find it. Then be sure and share it with others. joy is that in this little book that I've been reading from was the book was given to me in 2014 by Teresa with a, a sweet note in the front of it with love and that that brought me such joy that this is my scribble book and when Angie called me I knew exactly where to go for today's joy. Okay, thank you, Mayfrey. No, God is God is big on joy. When the angels came, they said, "We bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people." So, Paul would tell us to rejoice always in everything. Rejoice. So, if if you are a child of God. You need to be rejoicing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in this world to bring us down, but, man, we've got so much going for us, so many promises that God has made. Man, we need to be rejoicing. Speaking of which, Jesse had asked if he could share his testimony. So, Jesse, if you will, just come on and share because you've, you've got a lot to rejoice for and a lot to be joyful for. y'all doing all right I've been a little better been a little bit better under the weather this morning running to and fro you know God uh, he's worked miracles in my life those of you who don't know me <laughs> he pulled me out of a pit and set me in my feet upon solid ground you know I sat and I was reading in the Bible in John this morning and there's a verse stuck out to me John 5 and verse 9 says immediately the man was 
made whole. You know, I was sitting in the jail cell on March 1st, and God told me, he, 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 I got down, I was to a point. And I told him, I said, uh, I'm done with this lie. I've, you've got to change me. You've got to do something. I can't do it on my own. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of living it. And while I was doing this, while I was talking to him, there's some verses over here in Psalms showed me where I was at. And if anybody's in here that's got any kind of addiction, got anybody that's addiction, addicted, I would strongly suggest that you point them to these verses and see if maybe Christ won't talk through them like he did to me to help break the strongholds of these addictions. Psalms chapter 107, uh, verse 10 and following, the Bible says, Such is set in darkness in the shadow of death, being bound in the affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God, and he contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor, and they fell down, and there was none to hail. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands in sunder. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul aboreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord their trouble, and he saveth them out of his distresses. You know, I was sitting there, and for years I'd sat and professed that I'd been saved, I'd been born again. That's some from a time I was a little bitty child of 10 years old. I professed salvation. I was as lost as anybody in this world could be lost. You know, it wasn't because I didn't have good mom and daddies. And it wasn't because I didn't have a good grandma and grandpa. Matter of fact, when I was little, I had a drug problem. My mom and daddy drugged me through the church doors every time they was open. <laughs> but I want to tell you something right now. You train up a child in the way that they should go. They might depart from it for a little season, but they're going to come back. There's going to come a point in their life when God will bring them back. I was so far into the drugs. I was so far into the alcohol. I was so far into the women. I was so far into this world that I was lost. There was no hope in my life, and I professed something that I didn't have. This verse right here showed me, said, Son, verse 10 says, Such sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. I was sitting in darkness, and it wasn't the darkness of a jail cell. It wasn't the darkness of the possibilities of going back to prison. It wasn't sitting there being bound in iron. I was sitting in the darkness of hell because that's where my soul was at. That's where I was going. Everything that was happening to me was because of the father. At, at the time, my father, the devil. And that's who my father was at the time, was the devil. But, you know, he'd got me down to that point to do one thing, to bring me to where I'm at today. I got on my knees and I told him, I said, Father God, you've got to do something. You're either going to kill me or you've got to change me because I can't do this no more. I'd become to the point where I had emptied myself out. That reminds me over in Psalms, I can't remember which verse it is, it says, purge me with hyssop, make me whiter than snow, cleanse me, make me whiter than snow, give me a contrite heart and a broken spirit. He got me to that point, got my attention to that point after years of running from him. And I got on my knees and cried out from him, and he saved me right there on that. Not only did he save me, he told me to preach. And I just want to give him the glory to God. If he can turn me away from all this, if he can turn me from all the debauchery that I was living in, the sin and the hell that I was living in, he can do it for anybody. To this day, and I'm not taking numbers, it's the glories to his. Forty salvations has been born because of what God done in my life. Forty salvations since March the 1st. People says they want to change. They want a revival in their life. If you want to change and you want a revival in your life, get on your knees and get in this book and start praying to God because that's where it starts.
nowhere else. It starts with you through prayer. If he can change me, he can change you. But you've got to get to the point, get to the point, verse 13. Verse 13, then is a big key word. Then is a major word. Then they cried out. When you get to that point, then if you will cry out and you will put your trust and you will put your faith in him, he'll transform your life. Over in the book of Isaiah chapter 61, it said that the Bible says that they, he, he made the New cities, they build up the old wastelands. I'm paraphrasing here. I think it's verse 4. They build new cities, uh, build up the old wastelands, you know, makes new that which is desolate. He made me new right then. There wasn't no waiting period. There wasn't no uh, a year from now. It was instantaneous. He changed me instantaneous. He took the drinking. He took the drugs. He took the lying. He took the cussing. He took it from me. I'm begging you. Anybody here that's got these problems or anybody's got children, family members, don't quit praying because prayer is what brought me through it. Prayer brought me through it. I know Eric and Teresa prayed. I know Sam and Teresa prayed. I know Fritz and Joy prayed. For years, I know, I know these four prayed for years with my mom and daddy. And it's because of those prayers and the prayers of others that brought me through it. You can be a light unto somebody. You can be a transforming light by letting the light of Jesus Christ show to you and give them the joy to the world that was born on Christmas Day. I thank y'all. Good, that's the good thing about the God that we serve. Let's stand up and worship him together this morning. Not just about the manger where the baby lay. It's not all about the angel that sang for him that day. It's not just about the shepherds or the bright and shining sun. It's not all about the wise men who traveled from afar. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. About how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. It's not just about the presence underneath the tree. It's not all about the feeling that this season brings to me. It's not just about coming home to be with those you love. It's not all about the beauty in the snow I'm dreaming of. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. It's about how Jesus came to be born once so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. The beginning of the
the story is wonderful and great But it's the ending that can save you And that's why we celebrate It's about the cross It's about my sin It's about how Jesus came to be born once So that we could be born again It's about God's love Nailed to a tree it's about every drop of blood that flowed from him when it should have been me. It's about the stone that was rolled away so that you and I could have real life someday. So that you and I could have real life someday. It's about the cross. It's about the cross. You know, we focus on the manger. We focus on Bethlehem. We focus on the wise men. Folks, without the cross, it wouldn't be anything. I'm so thankful that it didn't end in Bethlehem. And it didn't end on a hill outside of Jerusalem. It hasn't ended yet because he's coming back. Man, I'm so glad of that today. But I am thankful for Bethlehem. And I am thankful for that manger. And I'm thankful that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. A woman and an angel a promise and a song a word too grand for any mind to hold a tax law and a journey a stable and some straw these tell the greatest story ever told. Oh, sing glory in the highest. He is come, our great Messiah. Come bow before this awesome mystery. Mighty God and fragile baby, here a lowly manger holds, and it's still the greatest story ever told. A hillside and some shepherds, a blaze of blinding light. Angels singing carols in the cold. Eternal revelation to men is dull as stone. The glorious, greatest story ever told. Oh, sing glory in the highest. He is come, our great Messiah. Come bow before this awesome mystery. Mighty God and fragile baby, here a lowly manger hold. And it's still the greatest story ever told. Sing glory in the highest. Oh, sing glory in the highest. He is come, our great Messiah. Come bow before this awesome mystery. 
Mighty God and fragile baby, here a lowly manger holds, and it's still the greatest story ever told. Mighty God, mighty God and fragile baby, here a lowly manger holds. And it's still the greatest story ever told. It's still the greatest story. And it's still the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest story ever told. And it never grows old. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Lord, we worship you this morning. Lord, we thank you for that manger. We thank you for the message that the angels brought to the shepherds. There is good news, and it brings great joy, for there is a Savior. He has come, and he offers salvation and forgiveness of sin to every person. All we can do, Lord, all we can do is worship and adore you today. You step down from heaven Humbly you came God of all creation Here with us In a starlit manger Emmanuel, light of the world, here to say, adore, come let us adore, oh come let us adore. Christ the Lord, let all that is within us adore. Wise men bring their treasure. Shepherds bow low, angel voices sing of peace on earth. What have I to offer to heaven's King? I will bring my life. My love, my all, adore, come let us adore, oh come let us adore him, the Lord, worship Christ the Lord. Angels sing, praises ring to the newborn King. Peace on earth here with us, joy awakening. At your feet we fall. Angels sing, praises ring to the newborn King. Peace on earth here with us, joy awakening. At your feet we fall. 
your feet we fall adore come let us adore oh come let us adore him the lord worship christ the Lord, let all that is within us adore. Angels sing, praises ring to the newborn King. Peace on earth here with us. Joy awakening, at your feet we fall. Angels sing, praises ring to the newborn King. Peace on earth here with us. Joy awakening, at your feet we fall. Adore, come let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore Him, the Lord. Worship Christ, the Lord. Let all that is within us adore, adore. bless your name and we praise you Lord we're just amazed at how awesome you are and how wonderful Lord how merciful how long suffering isn't he isn't he beautiful 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 isn't he isn't he Prince of Peace, Son of God, isn't He? Isn't He? Isn't He? Wonderful, 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 isn't He? Isn't He? Counselor. Almighty God, isn't He, isn't He, isn't He? And isn't He, isn't He, beautiful? Beautiful, beautiful, isn't he? Isn't he Prince of Peace, the Son of God? Isn't he? And isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? Wonderful. Isn't he counselor, almighty God? Isn't he, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he? Isn't he? Oh, isn't he? Beautiful. Beautiful. He's beautiful. Beautiful. Isn't he? Isn't he? Prince of peace and son of God. Isn't he? And isn't he? Isn't he? 
wonderful. He's wonderful. Wonderful. Isn't he? Isn't he? My counselor and almighty God. Isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? So wonderful. Isn't he? So beautiful. wonderful. As Isaiah said, you're a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And Lord, of the increase of your government and your peace, there will be no end. Lord, we know that's soon to come. And Lord, we look forward to that moment. Lord, until we do, help us to rejoice. Lord, help us to celebrate. Help us to set our affection on things above and not on the things of this world. And Lord, help us to look at the joy that's set before us as we run this race looking to Jesus. Father, we thank you that that babe in a manger became the Messiah, the sacrifice, the Passover lamb that gave his life for us, that shed his blood that we might be forgiven, that he rose from the dead that he ascended back into heaven, that he sits at the Father's right hand making intercession for every one of us and that he is our soon coming king. Lord, we're so thankful today. We love you and praise you. We give you this praise and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Folks, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Jesse, I appreciate you sharing that, man. That was a blessing. Amen. Wasn't that a blessing? God is good. God is good. A couple of things I want you to have on your prayer list this morning. Uh, Bill McKinney is in the hospital with some kind of infection. Please be praying for him. And... Uh, we need to be praying for a, a, a young lady named Cindy that's going to be having some severe surgery on Wednesday. So please keep Cindy and Bill in your prayers. I want to share with you for a few minutes this morning from the book of Hebrews chapter 12 beginning in verse 25. God's word says, See that you refuse not him that speaks. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more, and I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. I woke up. Sometime in the early morning uh, yesterday, Saturday, <laughs> with a phrase going through my head, stirred, not shaken. I'm waiting. I knew it would come. Ah. Now, I know none of you good Christians ever watched any of the James Bond movies. But some of us pagans may have. And uh, if you remember, when James wanted a drink, he'd always ask for it to be. I knew you watched it. Mm -hmm. Shaken, not stirred. <clears throat> so I'm laying there in the bed, and this stirred, not shaken is going through my head. God's got a sense of humor. I want to tell you that. If you don't believe it, look in the mirror. So I'm laying there in the bed, and, and that, it just keeps going through my head, stirred, not shaken. And the Lord said, that's how my people are supposed to be. 
stirred, not shaken. We need to be the opposite of, of what uh, old James was asking for. Uh, the text that I gave you this morning that the writer of Hebrews, probably Paul, took out of the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And this is what he's saying. He says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once and it's a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. And what I get from that is that just before Jesus returns, everything is going to be shaken. He said, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. He said, I'm going to shake all the nations. Now, unless we've been living under a rock, we're already seeing the nations shaken. We're seeing a lot of turmoil. We're seeing a lot of fear in this earth. The earth was shaken with the coronavirus. I mean, everybody was worried. The nations didn't know what to do. Nations would close down. Uh, air traffic would stop. The nations were shaken. And God said, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'm going to shake all nations. And then the desire of all nations will come, or the desired one is going to come, depending on which translation you're reading. So here's, here's the thing. As the world around us, as the nations around us shake, we need to be stirred, but not shaken. Paul was writing his second letter to the Thessalonian Christians. And this is Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He said, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul said, I don't care what you hear, I don't care whether somebody comes and says something or whether you get a letter from somebody trying to convince you that the rapture's already happened. I don't want you to be shaken. And he's telling us that regardless of what we hear, regardless of what somebody says, not just about the rapture being passed, but whatever is coming, God does not want you to be shaken. God doesn't want you to be shaken. Just like he was telling these Thessalonian Christians, God wants us to be stirred. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul's writing to Timothy, and this was probably the last letter that he wrote from the prison just before his, uh, his execution. He said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in you. And that's what we've got to be doing in these last days when the world around us is shaken. We're not supposed to be shaken. We're supposed to be stirring. We're supposed to be stirring up the, the presence of God within us, the gift that God's placed in us, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're supposed to be stirring up people around us in a good way. You see, there's a tremendous difference between being shaken and being stirred. Let me give you a, an example here. We all are familiar over in Matthew chapter 2 of the story of the Magi. You know, the wise men from the east that saw the star and they make the pilgrimage uh, to the nation of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem. And they come in, and they, they, I guess they're asking around, and somebody brings them to the king, to Herod. And they say, where is he that's born king of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Listen to this, Matthew 2 and verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. If, it's interesting, if you look the word troubled up in the Greek, it's tarasso. And it means to agitate a thing by movement of its parts to and fro. What does that mean? It means to be shaken, doesn't it? So Herod was shaken when the wise men came and said, where's the one that's been born king of the Jews? We've seen his star. We've come to worship. So he was shaken, and he was, and he was not shaken in a good way. He was terrified because being the Roman ruler, he knew there was going to be an uprising. So you remember the account of what, it, what happened? Because he was shaken, he issued the verdict to have all the children two years and under slain. But now, let's look at a different version here. The magi, or the wise men, on the other hand, were stirred because when they saw that star, when they saw that star in their nation, they're looking up, they were stirred to go and find the promised king. And when they found him, 
The Bible tells us they fell down and they worshipped him and they presented their gifts to him and they were not shaken by the king's commandment that you find him and you come back and you tell me. So they left, went back home in a different way. The king's command didn't shake them up. They were stirred to come and worship but they weren't shaken. They weren't afraid of what the king told them. They went back to their own country and didn't return to him. You see, here's the thing. The difference between being shaken and being stirred is this. When something shakes you, it troubles you. It makes you fearful. But when something stirs you, it energizes you and prompts you to take action. Now that bears repeating. When something shakes you, it causes you to be troubled and fearful. But when something stirs you, it energizes you and causes you to take action. Action. Now, the word to be stirred also means to mix. Uh, my wife's been having some problems with a nerve in her neck, and, and it's kind of rendered her right arm pretty much useless. She uses her left one to hit me. It's, it's okay. <clears throat> But since that right arm that she uses a lot has not been real effective, she's had me stir some things. Like if she wants some cornbread, get in the kitchen and stir this. And what that means is, you know, you take the bowl and you put the cornmeal in it and you put the buttermilk in it and you put the egg in it and you mix it. You mix it all together. So stirring also involves mixing. And I'll, I'll show you where I'm going with this. Consider when Israel was delivered from slavery in Egypt. We know that story of all the things that happened in the first few chapters of the book of Exodus up through chapter 12, how God brought Moses and Aaron down to bring the people out. And he enabled them to do certain things. And plagues began to take place. The water turned into blood. There were gnats. There were flies. There were frogs. Just all kinds of things happening. And just amazing darkness in part of the country. Uh, you know, the cattle dying. And finally, of course, we know on that night that we call Passover is when that angelic visitor came. And the firstborn in every family passed away except in the families of the Jews that had put the blood of the lamb on the door. And then after they're brought out, after Pharaoh releases them, they come to the, dead, uh, to the Red Sea and Pharaoh changes his mind and starts after them and God parts the Red Sea and they go through on dry land. And then after they get through, the Egyptians start through, God brings the water back and the Egyptians are drowned. And how God goes with them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then God comes down on Mount Sinai in his glory and in his power. They're seeing all these things. But here's the problem. They were shaken, not stirred. <clears throat> the reason I say that they were shaken, all these things shook them. But what happened? Moses is on the mountain <clears throat> meeting with God. He's getting the Ten Commandments. He's getting all these different things that God wants in the, in the way that he's to be worshipped. Shows them how to build the tabernacle. Designs the furnishings of the tabernacle. All these things are taking place. And while he's up there, what happens? The people revert to idol worship. Aaron, take this gold, make us an idol. Out comes the golden calf. And they were worshiping in this golden calf because they were shaken by what God had done, but they weren't stirred by it. Listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. Hebrews 4 verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Stirring involves being mixed. It involves having faith mixed with what we experience. You see, being stirred as a child of God means that we have faith mixed with what we experience in our walk with God. The shepherds on those hillsides around Bethlehem experienced an angelic visitation. 
They had a tremendous experience. Heaven opens up and God's glory comes down and the angels appear. And the angels begin to speak to them and give them that good tidings of great joy. The Savior has been born. You, you, he's, in, he's in a manger in Bethlehem in a stable. They believed. They had an experience. Faith came from that experience. And they were stirred to go find the baby. The wise men experienced seeing that star. Now why? What would, what would be, you know, I mean, we see stars all the time. Well, this was obviously a new one. One they hadn't seen before because these were people that studied the heavens. And they saw this new star. But how in the world did that make connection? I firmly believe it's this. The Bible doesn't go into detail about it. But here's what I believe. I believe there was an old man named Daniel that spent a lot of time there in Babylon. And he taught about a prophecy that was listed in the book of Numbers. I'll read it to you. Numbers 24 and verse 17. It says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And a scepter will rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy the children of Seth. Verse 19, the first part. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion. So when this star appeared, and I am firmly convinced that it appeared in a certain constellation, probably Leo the king. These people were familiar with the constellations. They were familiar with the constellations of the zodiac. And you see, astrology is, is, is something that has happened by Satan's influence into astronomy. But I believe all down through history, God used the constellations to tell and to teach the story of the gospel of what was going to happen. And when these wise men saw that star in that particular constellation, and they remembered that sometime back in history, this, this man, this Jew that had lived in Babylon, had taught about the fact that a king was going to be born that would have dominion. And there would be a star that came and announced his coming. And when they saw that star they experienced remembering what had been taught. And it stirred them because they believed and they made the pilgrimage to Israel, to Jerusalem, then to Bethlehem, and they saw the child and they worshiped, the Bible says. It was the fulfillment of that prophecy that they had heard. Because they believed they were stirred to go and find and to worship the one who would have ultimate dominion over the earth. You see... Many times God's word tells us that we must live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And experience is a wonderful thing. Every person needs an experience with God. We need to have that experience when the moment comes, like Jesse was talking about, when we come to a point in our life that we get on our knees and cry out in desperation to God. And God touches us. And God removes that weight of sin from our shoulders. And he gives us the knowledge that we've been forgiven, that his power has been poured out on us. But here's the thing about experiences. With time, experiences tend to fade. Most of us remember quite vividly that moment of salvation. We know that moment that God intervened in our life and transformed us, lifted us up out of that pit and set our feet on a rock. But as time goes by, that experience tends to fade. It doesn't go away. We still remember it, but it tends to fade. And I've seen so many people, when that original experience begins after time passes and, and it fades a little in their life, or maybe they're not experiencing those spiritual goosebumps and they're not having certain things take place, their faith begins to fail and they begin to move on to something else. But here's the, here's the thing, folks. Let me tell you something. We have to mix faith and experience. The just shall live by faith. <laughs> We're a lot like the Jews. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22 tells us the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom or knowledge. We're like them. We want something dramatic, something spectacular, and an, an experience, something that really 
is, is just, you know, it's just, wow. We're like the Jews. But folks, let me tell you something. Just because we're not feeling Holy Ghost goosebumps all the time, don't let the devil convince you that because of that, you're either not saved or you need to do something on whatever it might be. I remember vividly, <laughs> vividly the moment of salvation in my life when God transformed me like Jesse was talking about and changed the direction of my life and, and <laughs> caused me to want to do something that I never in my wildest dreams ever thought about doing, and that's preaching the gospel or teaching the word of God. That, was the, the, that would have been the last thing on the list that I would ever have thought about. I remember that vividly. And I remember those early days of salvation when, I, when the, the, the knowledge of the presence of God was so tangible and the, 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 the glory that just surrounded you and the love of God that was right there and every prayer was answered seemed like in just, just moments. And I'll never forget the day that I was praying and God said, when will you give me permission to test you? And my answer was never. God said, I'm sorry, that won't work. I said, Lord, everything's good. I mean, life's good. Let's just not, don't mess with nothing. He said, I'm, I, you know, he said, I'm sorry, but faith that's not tested is not any good. If everything's perfect, why do you need any faith? And I finally said, oh, all right. And it was like his presence withdrew. Man, that was the most painful time that I ever went through in my life. I mean, I knew he was still there. I knew he was saved because I'd had that encounter with him. But it was tough. And I would go and I'd ask him, Lord, have I sinned? What's happened? Where'd you go? I'm here. But your faith has to be tested. You see, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, it doesn't say the testing of your experience. The testing of those awesome times of blessing that give you a spiritual high. He said it's the testing of your faith. Faith is what you have to have when it seems like God's somewhere else. Faith is what you've got to have when it seems like the prayers aren't being answered. Faith is what you've got to have when things don't seem to be going in the right direction. But you know that you've done what the Bible said to be saved. You know that you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that you've professed him and confessed him with your mouth. You know that you spend time in prayer and time in the word of God. That you worship with believers. You know all that. But that's when faith comes in. You see, if you don't have faith, when things aren't going right, you're going to be shaken. But if you have faith, you're going to be stirred to seek the Lord that much more. We've got to learn to live by faith. You see, the time is coming when we're going to continually be in the presence of God. The time's coming when we won't have to walk by faith because we'll see him. We'll see his glory. We'll be surrounded by his glory. The time's coming when the enemy is going to be put down. The time's coming when this earth is going to be restored. For a thousand years, Jesus will rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem. For a thousand years, the lion and the lamb will lay down together. For a thousand years, there's not going to be poisonous snakes. There's not going to be hurting and killing in this world for a thousand years. And we'll be able to see God anytime we want to. And then eternity is going to come, and we'll continually be in the presence of God. But until that time, folks, we have to walk by faith. We have to live by faith. Think about just for a minute, think about that first, Christ, first Christmas. Man, what an, awesome, what an awesome night that must have been. Can you imagine those shepherds out there on those hills around Bethlehem? It was a night just like every other night. Nothing new, nothing different. The wolves weren't on the prowl. They were sitting there around the fire. 
talking about who knows what, how many, how many lambs had been born or what was going on or what so-and-so had done. And all of a sudden, heaven opens and those angels appear. Man, what, that must have been something else. What an experience. And, so, you know, and they, they get the message and they go to, uh, to Bethlehem and they search until they find the stable and they find the manger and they find Mary and Joseph and they find the baby. And then they go and they tell people about it. But then what? What happens after that? The Bible doesn't say much. In fact, I wonder if things just didn't quieten down for a year or so until the wise men show up. You see, we always have the wise men at the manger. They weren't there. <laughs> the Bible says they came to the house where the young child was. It didn't say the baby in the manger. It said the house where the young child was. And it was a year or so later because if you remember, Herod gave the order that children two and under would be destroyed when, they, when he couldn't find the baby. So when the wise men came and got Jerusalem abuzz, then there was another stir. But how long did that last after the wise men went back to Persia or wherever? Because, you know, as you read the Word of God, for about the next 28 years, it's pretty quiet. You reckon the shepherds still talked about it? Reckon anybody in Jerusalem said much? You know, it didn't affect many people except Mary and Joseph. It was really quiet. Th things had gotten shook up for a little while. But then everything got quiet again. <sighs> then suddenly, about 30 years later, Jesus comes on the scene. You see, if we're going to be those who are not shaken when the nations shake and when the world shakes, we've got to live by faith. Even when prayers don't seem to be answered, when we're not feeling or seeing things that we want to feel and see, we have to continue to live by faith and stir up ourselves to share hope with the people that are around us. You see, we need to remember that God has promised that when this earth is shaken, that's when the Savior's going to come. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Isaiah 35 and verse 4. It says this, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come. He's going to come. With vengeance, with a recompense, He will come and save you. That's His promise. You see, we're living in that time the Bible refers to as the great falling away. We're seeing people depart from the faith. We're seeing churches being closed up. We're seeing the rise of witchcraft, Satanism, so many things. People are departing from the faith. And God said that's what would happen just before Antichrist is revealed, just before his return. We're seeing our nation turning further and further from God. We're seeing principles being taught and laws being passed completely contrary to the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you, God's about to shake this nation. God's going to allow a shaking to take place in this nation like you've never seen. But here's the deal. During this time of shaking that we're entering into, if we're not living by faith, we're going to be shaken. We're going to be terrified like the rest of the world. But if we're living by faith, we're not going to be shaken. But what we see is going to stir us and energize us to take action, to stand strong for what we believe, and to reach out to the people around us with hope and the love of God. So here's what I want to tell you today. Cling to your faith. Make sure of your relationship with God and be stirred and not shaken. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the moment that you intervened in my life. I want to thank you for the experience of salvation. I want to thank you for the knowledge that my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. I want to thank you for the knowledge that my sin is forgiven and forgotten and that you're returning one day 
so that I can be with you. I want to thank you for every person here, for Jesse and these others, Lord, that they've had that encounter with you. And they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're saved. But Lord, we can't just go based on an experience. We have to mix it with faith. That faith that will sustain us when things aren't as we want them to be. When the devil's whispering in our ear saying, see, if God was real, this wouldn't have happened. If God was real, he would have answered that prayer. We've got to remember, we go through times of testing in this world. Our faith has to be tested. It's no good if it's not tested. But if we survive that test, if we remain faithful, then our faith will be to praise and honor and glory when Jesus returns. And if, our, and if our experience is mixed with faith, we will be stirred and not shaken. Lord, as we enter into this season, just before the return of Jesus, when this earth begins to shake, when nations are, are trembling, when men's hearts are failing for fear of looking at what's coming upon this earth, God let us stand strong, standing in faith, and that will not be shaken, but will be stirred to stand and to share the gospel. Lord, I pray for every person here. If there's anyone here today that does not know Jesus, if there's anyone here today that has never asked you, Lord, to be their Savior, to forgive their sins and surrender their life to you. Let this be the moment that they pray that simple prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive my sin. I believe that Jesus is truly the Son of God, the one who came, lived, and died, and rose again, paid the price for my sin, and I ask him into my heart, and I surrender my life to his Lordship. I know if we'll pray that, we'll be saved. We thank you. We love you. We bless the name of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray, and everybody said amen. amen. All right, we got one more thing to do today before you make a break for the steakhouse or where else. <laughs> uh, I want to ask the deacons to come up here for just a minute. Today we have the privilege of uh, receiving another deacon. So, Eddie, if you'd come up here. <clears throat> I always am thankful when God taps somebody on the shoulder and says, I want you to do something. And they say, yes. It's like when God says, uh, I need you to go on a mission trip. And we say, yes. So, uh, Eddie, got a couple of questions for you. Uh, do you feel God's leading you to do this? And you've prayed and sought him about that. And you are going to pray and seek God in guidance and leadership on what to do. And this is where you want to be. Yes. All right. Can't ask for more than that. We're going to pray for you, brother. <clears throat> Fellas, just lay hands on Eddie there, if you will. Father, we want to thank you for another man that has said yes to the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we receive him today as a gift from your hand. We ask for the blessing of God to be on him. Lord, we ask you to fill him with the Holy Ghost. And Lord, help him to be sensitive to your spirit. Lord, to seek you in every decision. And Lord, just put a, a, a heart in him that is, a, is, is an instrument that can be used to bless your people, to bring healing, to bring comfort and encouragement. Give him wisdom, Father. And Lord, just bless him and Sheila and their whole family. Lord, as we together serve you in these last days. So, Father, today we thank you for him and we receive him in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Shake hands with him before you get out of here. Come up and show him you appreciate him. <laughs>